Welcome to another episode of the Collab Talk podcast, where we discuss the convergence of technology, business productivity, and collaboration culture. And my guest today is Mike Bowers, a chief architect at Faircom Corporation. Welcome, Mike. Hi, nice to be here, Christian. You know, what's also exciting is that this is the first time um, that I've, uh, I've interviewed somebody for the podcast based in my own state. <laughs> that's cool like rarity. that's fantastic <laughs> like you're you're literally you're like 20 minutes away from me so it's just it's kind of weird yeah it's super <laughs> traffic actually it's it's a commuting time right now so maybe 40 yeah. minutes yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> well we're talking today about decoding technology for executive minds and i know that with your technical background we'll, we'll get into that i always like to start with like a further introduction like who you are, your background, your company, things like that. But we'll jump into that. But I, I think it's going to be self-explanatory as we get, get started here. But why don't you fully introduce yourself? All right. So my name is Mike Bowers. And I, like you said, I'm the chief architect at Faircom. Faircom is a database vendor. So we, have, we build our own database software and we sell that software to others. And uh, we're probably the least known database that's the most used in the entire world we have millions of deployments we're embedded in so many things now you make a phone call on one of the top major mobile providers um, it's going through our database the stock market transactions going through our database all the analysts of the stock market get their daily analytics um, from the data that's analyzed in our database and so every every um visa transaction in europe until recently when the US bought them out was going through our database in real time. You know, you ship products through the major shipping companies going through our database. So it's the Faircom database is a high speed, low latency database that gives you consistent, fast performance, hmm. uh, much more than all the other databases on the market. But we've been embedded in software for 40 years and we've been around since 1979 and uh, we never marketed. We were so early on in the industry, people just started using our APIs and our product and they just keep using it. And so we're in so many products, we just are living off of our success without marketing. And then we realized, oh, probably five years ago, we could do better. Let's maybe let the world know that we're here. <laughs> yeah, that's that's funny. Um, it's, yeah. uh, it was like, I, cause I had to go and, and look it up. I was like, no, I don't, I mean, I, it, most of my work, my day to day, I'm in the Microsoft ecosystem. So first question I asked is like, are you partnering with Microsoft? Um, but are you guys in specific industries or is it really just across all industries? Do you focus it's, on any specific spaces? We don't focus on any, cause we were so early on. We're in all the major industries. We're in embedded in medical devices. We, like I said, we run, we're in the stock market. We, finance uses us a lot. So mm -hmm. we're in a lot of financial, um, we're, yeah, we're just in so, like, for example, manufacturing uses us quite a bit. So uh, the largest semiconductor manufacturer in the world is using our product exclusively to manage their factories in, um, where they have other options for other databases, they choose us. So because of the performance and the availability, the reliability of it. So, yeah, we're just all across the board, it's just no one has heard of us. So that's why we're, we're getting out more and letting people know that there's a really affordable, high performance solution that you've never heard of that you should probably think about. I, it, when you talk <laughs> databases, I instantly, my mind shoots right to, there's a, a few different Dilbert uh, strips that you know, talk about it. It's like every solution that they ever uh, uh, you know propose starts with the creation of a database. It's like, why are you always talking about it? It's like, oh, we just like creating databases. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every app needs a database to yeah. store their stuff. So it's one of those yeah. fundamentals. It's kind of where I started my career um, early on was working for EDS and then Pacific Bell was, you know, managing massive amounts of, you know, you think about that, you know, the utility companies, the phone company, um, uh, you know, it was the EDS, it was EDS uh, uh, Medicare. So all the healthcare, California healthcare data, 
And it's, that's all it was. These massive, massive tables. I always joke, like one of my first projects, this massive database of 800 gigs, which we laugh <laughs> about now, you but know, but cool. when, but we yeah. did a migration and a major upgrade of software to it. And it got up to 1.2 terabytes. I'm like, yeah, I've got an eight terabyte music external drive. That's all it is, is my music on it. You know, so it's, it's, it's crazy how much that's shifted and changed. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. In fact, at my last job, we were, I, it was look, worked for a large multinational corporation and we had, you know, ter many terabytes of data. We had thousands of databases. I was, I was the data architect for them. And so we managed all the data for that organization and we had thousands of SQL Server, Oracle, MarkLogic, um, we had Postgres and Mongo and you know all these all, the, all these database technologies and being the head data architect for the organization, I was in charge of all those technologies and in charge of the BI team. I was the manager of it. I was the data architect for business intelligence and then the database technologies themselves. I even ran at one point to manage the core Oracle team, you know, so just various everything doing with data and it's a terabyte database is quite large. Because it's you know it's different than in, like video files on because I have video files on on the same kind of thing you're talking about and I have you know probably about forty terabytes of videos, yeah. but they they rack up very quickly. But you're talking about data, data, and it's yeah. a gigabyte Correct. is an encyclopedia, right? You can store an entire encyclopedia in a gigabyte, and of course a terabyte is a million gigabytes. Right. So. Um, that is I don't know, terabytes, a thousand gigabytes, and a petabytes a million. Anyway, yeah. that's a lot of encyclopedias. So that's yeah. an awful well, lot. And like, you index all that and look it up. You're right. Because I mean, back then we're talking about like 96, yeah, 95, 96. I mean, there wasn't a lot of, it's not images, it's not videos. I mean, all that stuff. And we were still early on in, in the internet and in the commercial use of the internet. It wasn't that kind of data. It was like raw data. I mean, that why one of the reasons why it expanded was we were adding geolocation data in, and I was like explain that people was like, "What are you doing there?" So, well, think about it. If if the phone company is going to go dig up your front yard, you want them two feet within where that cable is buried, not twenty feet. So yeah. having that more accurate data, that was a part of my job. Was I think I, it, while I owned that project twice, we did major upgrades of the geo data and that, but. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, you're right. I uh, completely forgot, but but yeah, you're right. It's 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 not the way that we look at the data and files and unstructured content and all the things today that can bloat those databases. But thankfully, everything storage is so much cheaper than it was. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Storage is cheap, but it, it's the speed of storage that matters, you know. And it's getting fast storage is still kind of expensive to uh, to get it, but it's much better than it used to be. Yep. But it's yeah. Well, I, so on, on this topic, I mean, I'd like to, to kind of get in and talk about, you know, what are some of the common things, like what are the gaps that you've experienced between, you know, the technologists and uh, leadership of, of organizations? And is that something, I mean, is this an ongoing, you know, uh, uh, you know issue even at your company today? Oh, sure. It, it really is because um, the, the funny part of the gap at Faircom is we're an engineering company first. So we're technologists first, business people second, which reverses the normal problem. Um, so we have a business team and, and, and the business team here is, is, is trying to, is asserting itself to become dominant. And what's happening is our, we're privately owned. The, uh, it's a family owned business. And so the owner is the father of a family um, and he's owned the business for almost 40 years. And he's an engineer. So everything's engineering. But the, his children, who are taking it over gradually, are business people. And so we're, we're in that transition between engineering and business. And it, so here's a real example that happened the other day. So we're, we have a SQL engine in the Faircom database. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a good one. But it's not the world premier one. And then, so our product is a NoSQL solution. We are a JSON database and an ISAM engine. Um, that's all technical stuff, but it just means that we're very really fast and to the bone, and we can outperform other systems. But our SQL database, compared to other da SQL databases, um, isn't the same level. It's it's kind of we're we're faster 
NoSQL database, then we are a SQL database. So our owner, being an engineer, goes, I want the best SQL database engine in our product. Um, I want one better than the one we have. Well, Postgres has a very good SQL engine. It's open source. We could put that in our product, and we're looking into doing that. Um, from a business perspective, though, it doesn't make a lot of sense because people can just use Postgres. Why do you need Postgres on top of the Faircom engine? Well, maybe you want some special features that are in Faircom. Maybe we can make a little case there. But it, but there's actually another use case that's important in the industry. That is the, the SQLite database. It's a free engine that's embedded in everything because it's free. It's in your phones. It's in everywhere. But it's it doesn't run very fast. It's a, it's a very primitive thing. You get what you pay for, and it's free. Right. So it's very primitive compared to what we can do. So we could take the SQLite engine, put it on top of our engine, which is industrial strength, and all of a sudden have an embedded database that blows SQLite out and have a, a great upgrade path for all those people who want to get to go to the next level. That's a great business argument for, for doing something. But is SQLite the best database in the world for SQL? No. Um, so the engineering in me goes, and the engineering in my boss goes, in uh, the owner, he goes, Oh, Postgres, what are you talking about? We want the best. But the business side goes, no, we want something we can sell. You know, so there's there's a real difference between the two. And it's a challenging, it's a challenge um, to understand the business and the use cases and get it right, or to build what the business needs, not just what the engineering guys say is best. You know, I've had uh, a variation of this discussion. I mean, there's a... Uh... I'll share the story again for folks that you know follow the podcast. You've probably heard this a couple times, but um, in business school in the late '90s, uh, was in like an operational management class or something rather around. It was more product, uh, uh, product management, product development focused. This this course, um, we learned about a template for a process called the House of Quality. And again, I know there's a lot of different things that are out there. I don't know if you're familiar with that one, but but essentially what it is is primarily for product development where you put in like all the various features the things that are in your roadmap around them and then you look at other measures like the time the cost the personnel the uh, uh customer impact you know from a support standpoint would it decrease the number of open tickets like kind of all those different factors and what's always fascinating about going through a process like that is that it allows you to kind of step back like you can be the technology guys like we need to have this and the best the best the best but when you go and weigh it against those other perspectives and when you then see the data i mean what we would often find and we ran the scenario several different times in the class and in breakout teams and using it and looking at this um, we found that you often end up with a priority list that's very different from what you thought and yeah. for for different reasons they're Sometimes you make decisions based on cost effectiveness. Other times it's because a competitive, uh, you know, it advances against competitors that, you know, uh, shutting down those threats. I mean, then all these different things from a support standpoint, we've like, uh, this is something famously like Microsoft, a lot of big complaint is like, why are you not in fixing these problems that we all know about? And sometimes the answer is because it's fixing that, like we'll eventually fix it probably um but it's not <laughs> selling net new licenses and so the yeah. demand on growth is higher than it is on those those people calling in support tickets it's just a so it's like a it's a managed it's a known cost of where the products are to have that which makes me think of like the movie fight club is like you know if the cost of fixing the car um you know of fixing the problem with the brakes of this model car is less than uh, uh, you know, the cost of the damages of everybody suing us, then we'll go fix it. But if the cost of fixing it is exceeds what we have to pay out for all the people that are getting hurt or injured or killed, then we'll not fix it because it's cheaper just to pay out, which is a horrible way to think of that. And uh, if you're a fan of the movie, anybody watching, it's uh, uh, it's a great movie for, for some aspects of like around consumerism and things like that. So. Oh, but, totally. Uh, yeah. You see it all the time. And my, my last job at that large multinational corporation, it was the engineers would often say, I want to rewrite this application. Why? Because I don't like the other guy's code. I want to make it better. 
And then they look for an excuse to rewrite because developers want to write new code, their code, their way in the coolest new language they can. So the cloud has become an excuse to rewrite applications. And I'm being really blunt here because this, you know, my last company, they were, they have a huge initiative to move to the cloud. It costs them millions of dollars more. They're putting the company at serious risk because when you run in the cloud, if their customers can't connect to the cloud, they can't run the apps, you know, and there's serious, the, the cloud isn't always running. The cloud right. isn't always there. And, the, and we're, and it's talk about single point of failure. You know, I, I just watched a documentary where we, it was about us and Stuxnet and how we created Stuxnet, right? And we we tried to shut down um, the, 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 not the reactors, but the centrifuges, right? We, we did shut some down, we slowed them down, but now um, Iran knows how to use the same thing against us and they can shut us down. And so we have a mute, we have a, a mad defense, but we won't shut you down if you don't shut us down because they can use these kind of things. Well, if they shut us down, they can shut down the electrical grid. They can shut down, they can shut down the cloud. They can shut down these kind of things. And it makes you think if our software is not diverse, if our software is standardized in one big vendor like AWS or Microsoft Azure, and you're sitting up on the cloud, what a nice target for a, a company, for an a independent state to go and shut down, let's just shut down Azure today and then shut down all those apps. You know, you put all your eggs in one basket, it's very dangerous. Yeah. And so I think the hybrid cloud is from a business perspective, something executives really need to think about. Yeah. Do you want all your eggs in, the, in one cloud and a couple of clouds? Do you want it on premise in a private cloud and across a couple of public clouds? How can you be safe? Um, keep your business running. It, it's interesting. I did, uh, so seven years ago, over seven years ago, I did research. Microsoft was a primary sponsor of this research. And um, and I actually partnered with uh, the, the Marriott School at uh, BYU. So I had grad students That's that cool. were running the research and did a project. They work with a lot of outside companies and, and did this where we looked in the in the SharePoint space with the huge push to the cloud was to really understand how big the on-prem market in just in this niche of SharePoint still was. And Microsoft, I mean, the executive, uh, Jeff Teeper is now the president of collaborative platforms and tools. Um, he even said, he's like, he was really surprised. Jared Spat Spataro before it helped fund that um, said, uh, you know, I, I like really surprised by the results. It, it, it we didn't think. You know, we thought it was moving much quicker towards that. People, there's still so much on-prem and hybrid environments that are out there. And if you go have the conversations, but again, you can have a lot of executives that are like, we want to move forward with the cloud, uh, you know, and, and you, know, you say, well, why? Here's reasons why. There are valid reasons for keeping some systems on-prem or, or at the very least hybrid. Yes, there's more overhead with hybrid. There is. You're maintaining, mm -hmm. you're monitoring two systems. Um, it, it's, it, it's, so it's harder to go and do that, but again, it's the business trade-offs, the value you've got to weigh those. You can't make a decision based on how exciting it would be to be out and have everything out in this, <laughs> the latest, greatest version of technology. Like I had my salespeople used to hate me when I would go and tell customers, I don't think you need to upgrade. Like you can do <laughs> what your business needs with this older version. You need to clean up, restructure. Um, you know, there's things that you could do to help it perform better and get another two, three years out of it before doing an upgrade. Uh, I guess I'm one of those, as a technology evangelist, uh, that the salespeople had a hard time with sometimes for being authentic, telling the truth yeah. about, you know, what does the customer actually need versus what can we do? Yeah, and a lot of time the product a technology is sold on the latest, coolest sounding feature. But like I love what you said earlier about the real cost of ownership, the real value proposition. And sometimes, in fact, I would say often the real value proposition is not the latest, greatest feature. It's actually the non-functional things that, for example, do you have to hire DBAs? So do you buy a database product? You, you have to maintain and support it. And usually and usually you have to hire at least two database administrators so that they have a life or they're going to be on call 24-7, 365 days a year. So they have to take vacation. You need two. So that's an overhead of two hundred dollars to $350,000 a year total cost of that person. Well, you buy the database 
depending on the vendor, it could be you know eighty thousand eighty thousand dollars a core. It could be four thousand dollars a core. It could be if you get Faircom a lot cheaper than that. But because we we don't. But Faircom, for example, our one of our secrets is we don't need a DBA. When you look at a cost per core, if you buy a ten core computer at at say four thousand dollars a core for say um, a really good deal on SQL Server, for example. Um, that's that's forty thousand dollars, but your two DBAs to go run that thing are five hundred thousand. Well, if you can get rid of the two DBAs and run a database without DBAs, you save yourself five hundred thousand. In fact, the database license cost and the support becomes irrelevant at that point because it's because that's a small, tiny piece of the money you're really saving. The non-functional aspect of a database, can you actually have a database without a DBA? I mean, the Oracle guys would say impossible. I was an Oracle DBA. I ran a team of Oracle DBAs and it's super hard. We took, we had a team of, of 12 Oracle DBAs supporting a large company, which also had 50 DBAs out in the, the, in the portfolio supporting the customers. Mm -hmm. So we had a core team of 12 that I managed. We had a core team of two SQL servers because SQL Server was so much easier to manage than Oracle. But you take, you could drop that down to none with the Faircom database. So you look at the cost of, to the organization and the functionality to the developers the same. Yeah. So I mean, at Faircom, there, there's little differences. Faircom is faster and more consistent in performance. Um, but other, other than that, there's no DBA. Wow, that's a huge cost savings. But what is that the first thing you go when you go for, for a database? I don't want a DBA. First, they assume you have to have them, and so you don't even think about it. But that's well, especially be because that, first that world, I mean, that's going to be counter to everything that you've understood in working in the space that, hey, we have to have somebody who, you know, DBAs that know this, that know the system, that know the data, that can make sure, like, if something goes wrong. I mean, that, that almost sounds yeah. counterintuitive. If we don't have the experts on hand, what if something goes wrong? Yeah. And that was, it was a funny thing. When I first was hired at Faircom, I flew to London, um, and we met with our customers there who was Visa, Visa Europe. And yep. we met with their DBA team and they had other databases too. Um, but the Visa system actually ran on the Faircom database. And uh, so they had other databases for analytics and for other things they were doing. And those DBAs spent all their time in the other systems keeping those running. And they said, you know, the scariest thing is this Faircom database doesn't need anything. It never goes down. It doesn't need tuning. It's just, there's no DBA required. So we're scared to death of it because we never touch it. We never fix it because ne it never breaks. Yeah. You know, I said, well, I said, well, don't worry. Then they go, we don't worry because it, it, we've had this for 10 years and not had any problems. One time they ran out of storage. That was a storage issue, right? But they call support and they go, yeah, you ran out of storage. We tell them that and they go, oh, we had more storage and it's back up and running. Um, so the, it, the database itself never broke and had problems. But we were there as a company and we support them. And our customer service is so good. You just call us and we take care of you. So we have major mission critical systems that are running 24-7, 365, doing 500,000 transactions per second continuously with no DBA, with, with just working. And you just call our support whenever something goes wrong and we help you. They usually have some people on staff assigned to it, but it's just a name only because we don't yeah. need a DBA right. to run our to run our product. It changes the game though. Think of the cost savings. If you could roll out, because the last organization I was in, we had over a hundred DBAs and at 250,000 a year, which is your total loaded cost, give or take. You think of the money on that. That's a lot of money. I think if you could drop that to, to maybe two, just so you have people assigned to support all that stuff. Yep. Um, wow, that would be a massive cost savings. That's a business thing, not a technology thing, but the technologists go, oh, I want to be on the coolest, newest database. I heard of some weird database called X. Let's do that one. And I know that because I was the architect and I had to go fight off all these technologists coming in and saying, I want this cool new one. I want this cool new one. I would say, well, let's go look at it. Do you really need it? And they would make up stories like, well, my, your database you're offering isn't fast enough. And their numbers were way wrong. They just, the reality is in the vast majority of applications, the speed of the database now is is good enough on almost every database, and and the development experience is about the same. So it boils down to these non-functional things like the cost of ownership, mm -hmm. and organizations are kind of used to what they have, so they're going like, oh, we'll stick with what we have. But they should be thinking right now, 
if I got rid of Oracle and SQL Server and went with something like Paracom, could I achieve the same performance and reliability without those DBAs or with much fewer? You know, yeah. And then that could save millions of dollars. How, how often do, do you have, we talk about in your organization, we talk about you know, um, clients, other organizations that you've uh, run across, but how often are you having the conversation about um, the decisions, the business ask, the business impact and ROI of some of these technology investments. Is that oh, all the time? Um, especially my last job, where I was the one in having to make those the, those recommendations to management. Um, so I evaluated every single major NoSQL database out there and SQL database, and had, we had to make all kinds of decisions and did total. ROI to get off one major Oracle, I said it, but one major platform to get on to another one. I'll guess which one. Yes. Um, <laughs> because of the license yeah. cost. Yeah. And right. and I and we were saving we saved the organization millions of dollars by making that move. And it's a very hard move. Um and we do the same thing in my role now working for a database vendor. When I talk to our customers and our and our, and potential customers, we talk about the ROI. Um, and also there's performance and there's niche things that where our database outperforms everyone else. Of course, we focus on that value, but it's these, these non-functional things are huge. And that's actually a hard sell because you're talking to the engineers who just want the coolest, newest thing. Right. So I guess my advice to the CEOs and executives who are listening, your engineers are, are telling you technologies that will will make their resumes look awesome, right? And it's not, I'm not just saying that because I'm trying to sell you Faircom, I'm not. I'm just, this is the reality I've watched for all my entire career. This, the developers want the coolest things on their resumes because it's cool and fun for them. And then they tell you that's the best and it's not a business decision for them. It's a total, what they wanna work in. Well, um, I, I had, I learned very early on. In fact, it was when I was working at EDS um, as a tech writer and business analyst that uh, I, I kind of saw this pattern that um, like going and talking to clients, because our client, State of California, was on site and to go have conversations with them. And by the way, for those that aren't familiar with, with uh, EDS, it's the thing I hated about that job is that you have to wear suits. Oh, because like, <laughs> the client was on site and EDS was very much in the suits. And I'm like, yeah, but none of the clients, they're all wearing jeans and T-shirts like they don't care. But anyway, um, no, but having the conversations, it was, I, I started to understand like going and talking with the client and gathering their requirements, defining the, here's what the outcomes of this project, what they want out of it uh, is that they're, I mean, they would share their feedback of what the requirements were based on the lens of their understanding today, meaning that they had a crappy old system so they would say, well, I need these things. And they list out the requirements based off of what they knew that system did some of it poorly, but they, what they really went and did. You then go and show them all this advanced stuff. Hey, all this kind of cool stuff. And go back and ask them the same questions. And suddenly the requirements are through the roof. So the what my lesson that I learned was that um, you have to... Uh, uh, slowly add in, show them the art of what's possible. You can't, like, again, I would have, you know, leaders that would read the in-flight magazine, see something cool. This is what we want. We want to go and do and be like, yeah, that's like four steps away from what we have today. And to make it work, because there's other little issues. Again, this is the stuff that maybe not even engineers think about, but the PMs do, the people that have to train, think about adoption, long-term adoption, change management experts, you, you can't just go in and drop brand new technology in. It breaks process. People, when they, when you change too much too quickly about the way that they do their jobs, they will find their way back into those old unhealthy patterns. They are slower to adopt the new technology. It has to, there has to be an organic factor to that. And I mean, so part of, uh, you know, as I would talk with, leaders, I would talk, part of that was not just talking about the technology, but talking about the business implications of the, the, the change to talk about the impact of change itself. Oh yeah. I love that. I had an experience when I worked for Mitsubishi Silicon America, they're a Silicon manufacturer 
um, in Oregon, and um, they had a new CEO come in, and he says, I'm trying, he wanted to get better information. All CEOs need great information to manage the business. And inventory information in the current manufacturing system in the ERP they had was limited, and they didn't, they couldn't trust the inventory information. So the solution that someone sold him on was, let's get SAP. SAP will solve all your problems. It's the best big ERP in the world. It's the best software. So they threw technology at it. And I was part of the team that transitioned from the, the old system to the new one. And we, you know, it cost millions of dollars to get the licenses to do this, to do this um, migration. It was a huge project. And in the end, after we've migrated and running, everything is a disaster because the problem wasn't the technology. Uh, the problem was understanding the problem. Why is the inventory data not coming through? Well, it's not a big, it's not the technology you used. It's how it's the process of gathering the inventory and tracking the inventory data. It's your process. You could have fixed that process in the old system, um, or you could fix the process and put it in a new system. But they didn't fix the process. They just threw a new system at it, and it, and the new system changed at forced changes on the process and made things worse because now you don't have a good process and you're breaking a bad process, which made things even worse. So it's, you really have to get to the root cause of what the, what your needs are and then build a solution around it. And technologists tend to just say, no, just buy this technology. It'll solve the problems. And that's, I've, I've seen that so many times. It's a, it's, that's where you have your role. As you were talking to earlier about business analyst, you know, that role is so important to, to see through the technology hype, you know, because the, there's so much hype around technology and to see what, is, what am I really trying to accomplish? Yeah. And then what is the real solution here? That's hard. And it's sometimes the answer is no fun. Well, let's go document our processes. Let's go do some you know, six sigma on our processes and really figure out what the real root cause problems are and fix those. And then if there's software that could help us, let's talk about it. Yeah. Well, that's what I, there, I worked on a project when I was at Microsoft. Um, I was over in an operations organization and we brought in an external consultant who was a, 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 like a change management, a systems thinking consultant. And so um, her job was to help us not we were uh, i had a shared services team and so we owned a bunch of internal systems and tools sharepoint environments other other tools and environments um and we but we were also external very large customers working with amazon working with you know like uh, um a bunch of big other big companies um uh into it was the advertising operations team but to um so this consultant helped us to look more holistically at not just the technology changes, but to think about at each level to think about, okay, what happens to the people and the training and the, the adopter, like that side of it, to the business systems. So the rules, the policies that we have in place to look at kind of all those different things. Cause you're right. It's easy, especially if in an engineering company where you're all technologists, you're all looking at it through that lens. And then you, you, then you've got some support staff. You might have some, you know, uh, uh, external partners and guests that come in that are not as technical that then get stymied by the change and then can't move forward. They can't do their jobs. It's, I, if you go back and look at, it's a common pattern with even like massive integrations of companies, an acquisition that happens. And a lot of the, that's a, in fact, that's a great example. Um, the, the integration of different cultures and teams and all that, it's, it makes business sense. It might make product sense, revenue sense, all those different things. But where they fail is to understand the holistic bringing together of these systems and processes and the cultures and that it fails on process and culture and it has those other rings, other things that aren't usually articulated that aren't you know they're not looked at and measured as part of the decision like hey let's go and do that and that that's hard to do that's yeah that's why it's not done so much and that's why we that you know doing the hardcore analysis of the root cause of the problem 
is harder than just, oh, let's just go buy some technology and I hope it fixes the problem. Um, yeah. Well, it's, it's, um, I, I don't know if you have any other uh, examples of, uh, you know, how, how do you typically go and convey a, you know, a complex technical problem to business leaders? Is there a, is there a, an approach, a technique, a, a way that you, you do that and have those conversations, maybe even with your customers? Yeah. Uh, First off, we have to speak in English. <laughs> what, my <laughs> acronyms aren't understood? <laughs> what? You know, and I was just thinking of some of the acronyms I was just throwing out there. Like, you know, I said the cost per core. Like that was, you know, to me, that's second nature. But it was the cost per machine you run the software on. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's you have to translate into the terms your audience understands. Now, a lot of times, I being a database company, we're talking to developers are our primary customers and so they're technical so that's actually easy um but we do have a new audience if we're coming we have a new product line we're selling we've created a whole new line to integrate factories it's called the faircom edge and this is an end user product so that's a different a whole different product line for a company like faircom which is a you know we write code for developers um what what it, the way it evolved was the in the manufacturing world They've got really old technology. In fact, you would say manufacturing in general is in the 1980s in their technology. And the reason is they buy these multi-million dollar pieces of equipment that last 40, 50, 60, 70 years. And they keep them for that long. Well, though you can imagine the data interfaces on something 40 years old is 40 year old IT technology. We were just talking so uh, last week <laughs> about, uh, um, so one of the things EDS tr invited me to become a COBOL programmer. And, and I'm just like, yeah, no way. And then I saw friends that were in that line where they were making like 250, 300 bucks an hour. Um, yeah. Again, Y2K. And even after that, all the financial oh, systems. Today, for sure. Right. I mean, it's yeah. it's a, I know that there, there's not a lot of COBOL experts out there anymore, but if they are, they're making bank. And they're really needed. I mean, that's, that. Just to throw a two cents in there, Faircom has a product that modernizes COBOL. And what we do is we put, the problem with COBOL isn't the language, it's a programming language. All programming languages are basically, I know there's differences and I know them very well, but they're little details, they're, they're nuances. The reality is if it's a programming language, I can program in it without even knowing the language. And, and it's, the language isn't the problem. COBOL is not the problem. The problem with COBOL is that you it has built-in database. It's not even a database. It's built-in data management system where you write to files and you read from files. And that that direct read and writing from files slows it down and causes lots of problems. It prevents it from scaling. And so uh, what Faircom has done is we've, we put our database, which is that industrial mission critical database underneath COBOL, we have a technology that allows us to bridge and, and let the COBOL files be written directly into our database, not through SQL, not through translation, which is slow it down and be super slow. That's what SQL Server and Oracle and other databases tried to do, failed completely. We, our technology is co fundamentally compatible with COBOL at our core data engine. So we could plug it in and get the same performance you're getting from COBOL without, with the scalability and the you can scale in terms of concurrent users. You can get more concurrent users and faster and bigger data and parallel data, all kinds of cool stuff. Hmm. Well, we do that. All we have a large number of financial companies that have COBOL apps that are running their apps um, without changing a single line of COBOL code and just replacing the the file system underneath with the Faircom database. And you get all these cool database features. So as you mentioned, COBOL, I had to say that because we have a lot of COBOL customers, um, in addition to normal database customers in our new edge world of manufacturing factor, manufacturing customers. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's fun to talk to those uh, COBOL developers because they're making bank on COBOL. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. I, well, I was just aware of that too, just because of you know that time there uh, in early two thousands, I worked with a with a company, we had a lot of finance, like big, like uh, Visa USA, uh, Visa you know, Inter Inter International, American Express, so a lot of uh, Schwab, and 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 so we were still trying to find, locate Cobol uh, uh, engineers for some of these clients 
for years, you know, again, after Y2K. So yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I got, I heard a lot of those, those, those stories, but yeah. Um, you know, the tricky part with COBOL too is you have millions of lines of code in COBOL and you're like, how do I, I can't replace it. I don't take the risk. My whole company runs on this app. And so I have to keep it going. But the cool thing you put the Faircom database underneath, it is, you can have at the same time, all your COBOL data going, reading and writing into it. You can have a Java program, a web program, a dot .NET program, doing the same thing, reading and writing to it. Cause the database now exposes the data automatically out to these other programs. So now you can build side-by-side -side solutions, a Java solution sitting right next to your COBOL solution and slowly add abilities that you don't want to put in your COBOL app you, or migrate off if you don't, if you want to migrate off. It opens up the doors for you in a way that no one else can do it. That's kind of- uh, Is it the opportunity, Mike, though, really? We just need to put AI in front of it that I can use natural language <laughs> talk, talk to it, you know? Well, the, the problem with COBOL isn't that. The problem is that storage system. Um, so yeah, the AI won't help with the storage system, but once you replace, once you fix the core problem of COBOL, which is the storage system, then yeah, then you can do all kinds of, in fact, we have customers who write, who write COBOL code that turns it into Java and then runs it against, a, a, it's pretty funny. So you could go, you can write Java programs that convert to COBOL and COBOL to convert to Java and AI could do all that for you. It's just the reliability of AI is not quite there to, to do right. it, but yeah, yeah. the, the, um, but as you were talking about, how do you explain technical things to business people? Well, yeah. I kind of jumped into the COBOL solution to do that. So hopefully I actually explained it using English language. I don't know if I succeeded uh, to explain how the problem with COBOL isn't COBOL, the language. It's the storage, where it stores the data, how it stores the data. And if you can fix that problem, you can breathe new life into your COBOL apps. That's how I talk to the business about the Faircom COBOL system, COBOL yeah. solution. Yeah, that's, uh, and that's, again, I go back to, as we started, you know, talking about what I found I did as a business analyst was a bit of storytelling around it. It was trying to find, yeah. you know, a story, a way to convey that message and a capability in a way that they could, you know, uh, non-technical people could understand that. Be like, oh, okay, I, I get the differences there. I mean, it, it's it's funny. I even uh, did that with, like, was trying to digest about, like, um, like, so we both, we live in a space, for folks that don't know, it's like the blockchain was a, like, we're at an epicenter here in Utah um, for a couple things. Uh, FinTech is huge in Utah. Um, blockchain, we were kind of a hotbed of, blockchain technology so getting in and talking about um you know being a database company in in this this space i know it, a lot of the talk uh, chatter around blockchain has died down it's kind of fallen behind you know ai now but um i mean there's still just a ton that's happening and moving that space forward but the way that i was uh, like i even figured out and totally understood it was through storytelling to myself was trying to translate it uh, as I was learning about it into a way that I could understand. And like for, for me, and I, and I, I also one of those people where I will write it down first and, you know, and then, and, and change it that way. And it's how I actually learn about things is writing about it, investigating, researching and, yeah. and putting that story together. But how I've then gone back and explained it is, is more um, blockchain was uh, talking about it in the, uh, in the gaming world, like I don't care about the cryptocurrency side of that, like that was just mostly scams and and uh, um, uh, people that I don't trust that are out in that space largely. Um, but the blockchain, the underlying technology that makes that possible, I think I'm very uh, I'm a proponent of it. I think it has a lot of potential. Um, but I talked about it in sense of like gaming and gaming culture. Now I've got adult kids and we're really into gaming and we talk about um, using the, uh, you know, like real, real world dollars fiat to purchase digital benefits in the gaming system and by more credit to doing things and moving the things around and being able to trust the transactions and things around that way. And so that's how I, I learned that was essentially through that storytelling was finding a parallel to that complex problem and phrasing it and telling it in that way. I mean, is that something that are you doing oh, the same thing? 
Yeah, I love the analogy. The analogy is is a wonderful way. If people understand one thing and you compare that to a new thing, you can learn the new thing by comparing it to the old thing. So I love that approach. It's a really great way to work. And what, what would you say, um, any advice that you would give to uh, executives who want to, in general, uh, like, improve their understanding of technology is that something that you think in the modern day and age i mean it's it's hard in modern business to separate technology and you know the advantage that technology can give to companies no matter what the focus is of the company i've worked in the manufacturing sector so you could be creating non-technical product you know on a manufacturing line well, we could talk about improving the speed, the output of those things through technology. Um, I, I actually helped build a demand planning technology so I could, so designers of a product where they're collaborating with vendors around the world, partners around the world, but they could say, if we made this change to this product and we're sourcing material from a dozen different locations to one location or multiple locations to build it, we could see the impact of making that change on when will trucks be on the road with our product to stores. It would be a three-day delay, a five-day delay. And are we okay with that? You know, like based on the change that's made. It's it understanding technology, I guess my point there is uh, you know, it's kind of fundamental with modern business. It is. And it, the the challenge I think is well, first you have to understand it, but you have to understand it in terms of Quality, not hype. So it is, which is hard. True. Which yeah. is hard to get past that. It really is. In fact, I was because I know the database industry so well. So I Faircom hired me. I would have analysts for venture capital firms come to me constantly at my previous job because I, I had so much buying ability for one thing, but also the ability to understand the entire space. And so they would come to me and validate, okay, I, we got this one company doing a database. Tell me about them. Are they viable? Should we invest in them? You know, the reason why I'm saying this is a, a CEO that has a person, not a CTO, not necessarily as chief technology officer, because those guys have to execute. They have to deliver. They're preoccupied too much. Somebody more who's t who has the unique ability to bridge the gap between understanding the reality of technology beyond the hype and communicate it to the CEO and how it can impact the business. That role is gold because you can't expect a CEO to fully understand those things. You need someone who can go beyond the hype. So Silicon Valley makes up hype cycles intentionally yeah. to promote next generation software. It's part of their business model. This is, it's not accidental that there's these hype cycles. It's real and they, and it's, and they and they they try they pushing new hype cycles on everything all the time, hoping to get one to stick enough to get people to go invest into it. So take here's an example: you know, Internet of Things. Internet of Things is a big hype cycle. Now, is there reality behind it? Yeah, my stove can connect to the web. My refrigerator can. I've got a smart house. Now I have to look at it and go: Is there really any value in any of that? Mm, it's really marginal. Yeah. I, once I've, I've been doing this for 15 years with a smart house and like, eh, you know, anyway, it's questionable yeah. how much real value I actually like turning on a light switch more than, to, you know, talking to, Hey Google, turn on my light switch. That's a yeah. little, takes me more effort to do that than flip the switch. But um, in the manufacturing world, there is a real need to automate. They're back in the eighties. Yeah. And, and so as I analyzed that space and we looked at that at Faircom to see, should we get in this space? There's huge opportunities to go to standardizing the technology. So you know how the internet transformed the entire world. Mm -hmm. So TCP IP is a protocol. Then you put HTTP, again, all this tech jargon stuff. But these are, these are standard protocols that allowed the world to talk to each other. Well, manufacturing lives in the Tower of Babel. They can't, their devices can't talk to each other. They're back in the eighties and they're back these binary bits, ones and zeros. And you pay people, pay people like me, $300 an hour to come in there and can and convert from this to that. And you're, you're spending a fortune just to get little things done. And then you can't get the data out of manufacturing. You can't run your facility right. because you're stuck in eighties technology. So what we've done is at Faircom, we've created a new product line that is the universal translator that converts from these impossible to read te old technologies into new internet standards 
And there are some new standards for manufacturing that, well, they're not new. IBM created this technology called MQTT, which is a message queue technology. Mm -hmm. They created it back in the 90s, actually, but it became, um, it was it's open and people started implementing it. And so there are open source vendors who done open source MQTT brokers so that you could do messaging. Messaging is kind of like Twitter for machines. Yeah. So you just pop, you send messages to the machine and to make sure everyone gets the message right. with guaranteed delivery. Well, Faircom, we built our own mission critical MQTT broker because the other brokers aren't mission critical. They lose messages. They can't scale. They can't deliver. So we, we solved that problem. And then we found that companies are adopting MQTT manufacturing because it's a way, it's time for them to upgrade from the 1980s to the 2020s. And you need to use internet technologies to do it. So you're going to use technologies like MQTT, JSON, and you're going to bring those together. We've built a package to do all that for end users. So Faircom is, is transforming the manufacturing industry right now with this new universal broker that allows you to communicate across all these technologies and get the data where you want it. So the CEO who needs data from the manufacturing floor can get it now just by buying our product and with no coding, just point and click um, in the user interface, you can collect data from devices and you can deliver it to your ERP system. Yep. Now, uh, there, hey, hey, I complete, I personally, I understand that space because 23 years ago, I mean, we were trying to do the same thing. It was, you know, create this, you know, service bus model of these disparate yeah. tools and share, you know, uh, uh, data in between, you know, the, these things to be able to communicate things. So like this, this demand planning system, like the, the, the vision of this was that you could, um, if you, you, you've got your design team in Palo Alto, California says, you know, we're going to make a change to this. We want to make this product more slender, all the components in it. Well, it's actually being the, the inside of it designed in Japan with, uh, a, a team that's in Korea, another one in London, manufacturing of it's being done in the Philippines. I've actually been down to the Philippines, to the facilities south of Manila, the manufacturing plants with thousands of mostly women in matching outfits. It was going and huh. eating lunch in the lunchroom was a very surreal experience. Um, but wow. seeing seeing the direct impact of the kinds of changes. Yeah, this is the place you'd love this. It was, you talk about you know, old school 80s technology, like this massive high-tech manufacturing facility. It was all Matsushita. Um, so uh, um, Panasonic in the US. Uh, and uh, they the only internet connection was an uh, ISDN line, a single cable that was in the manager's PC when one of the other operators needed to use it to transmit messages about the status of they they would go and get it and go plug it into their computer, transmit the stuff oh, and wow. give it to the next person. Crazy, you know, yeah. And this was in the early two thousands, but, but yeah, I mean the, the, you know, and I was jokingly talking about throwing AI on top of it. Cause I think a lot of people like getting new technology, newer tech, like, like people have, uh, you know, unrealistic expectations of what it can and can't do. And you need to, understand fundamentally how AI works today and then you'll you'll have more managed expectations about what you can actually get out of it on the other other side of that but mm -hmm. but the idea though of being able to have that universal translator that it would go and it would understand and be able to to know the difference between the two systems communicate between them and then give you an interface and this with AI, a natural language command, and then go and make those changes. Yeah, there's still work to be done, but honestly, are we that far away from that? We're not, because right now the, the, there's several layers in technology to make that happen. And so Faircom right now has built the layer to do the physical work, right? AI can't do the physical translations mm -hmm. and it's a higher level thing, but the language feature of AI where you can talk to it that has that has to convert to something the machine can understand. Mm -hmm. So what we've done at Faircom is we built a, um, a, well we built a user interface on it so humans could point and click and make it happen. But we also have an API layer that's in JSON that allows that's something the AI can talk to. So it would be very easy for us 
to talk to the API, to use AI, talk and have it generate the JSON, and then our product would just do it. Yeah. So you could just talk to it, and make it happen. I haven't, we haven't done that yet. We're focused on the core engine, but yeah, we can add AI, just talk to the machine and it'll just configure it, make it go. So I might have to play with that. Um, that's a good idea. It's a, it's a, it's well, really again, you can start your own hype cycle around that <laughs> about how that like, hey, we're doing this, you know, AI in the front end of this thing. And it's a whole nother thing. And, and then you just tell people says, well, we're not going to be able to actually get it to you in six to 18 months, but you know, it's, but it's on, on, on their way. <laughs> yeah. The thing about machine learning people need to know and artificial intelligence is you have to train it and you have to train it with good data and good data means the, the people doing the training which are usually data scientists, they need a database. So what they do is they pull all this, the data, the source data that they need to make a decision into a database. They curate it, find the good data, find the bad, they classify it by hand, you know, or they get a crowdsource and they get a group of people to classify the data, but they label the data and say, this is good, this is bad, this is whatever. Um, and once you've labeled it, you can send it to us to, Machine learning is just statistical analysis. So it's just software algorithms that can look at data and statistically classify the data based on what you've told it, it is good or bad or what is, you know, happy, um, sad or depressed and angry. You could, whatever you classify the data as, it'll say, okay, that's what it looks like. These data values in this statistical range are happy. These values are angry. These values are sad. And then once you've trained it, It'll just continue, you throw data at it and it'll say, yep, happy, sad, angry, you know, that's how it works, but you have to train it. And that's the investment you have to make is training your system. Well, the, the big, the big vendors on AI have done spent hundreds of millions of dollars to train, you know, just enormous amounts of things and natural language processing is one they've done, which is really cool. So now, now it can understand the language enough. Um, now you, the only thing we're lacking is you have to train whatever the human says and turn it into the target information. So like if you're a programmer, you say, I want to create a program that does X, Y, Z. If I can learn to speak in a way that the AI understands what I'm saying, like create a for loop, uh, iterate 10 times or whatever I'm saying in computer gibberish, then the, if the AI can understand it, it'll generate the code for me. Do that in C sharp, do it in Java, do it in whatever language. So that's the next level we have to do is train the AI to do concrete things in my system, and then it'll just do it. It's so funny. Again, going back 25 years, I was mentioning before you know, work, working with rational software. I mean, one of the things that they were trying to do, their vision for that was using the unified modeling language and in their, in their you know, rational rose product. Which yeah. IBM, I, I you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm unaware of what IBM did with it after, you know, 2003, 2004, but um, but the whole concept was that I could go and build the model, describe it, and again, in this case, we're talking about verbal using using words, using language to be able to go and do that. Um, but you'd build that UML model, and then um, it could then understand the model and generate the code to do that do that thing now it was not greatest code that came out of it, it right you know, but <laughs> i mean it's kind of like a lot of uh generative ai is today it's that it's it can't give you a polished kit write a novel but it can give you a pretty detailed outline as you refine it it can speed up the process for creation it can generate scripts you have to be very careful to run that code run those scripts um, verify everything. Don't trust. Verify. Right. For sure. Um, but speed up that process. It's better than we're starting from scratch to create something. Totally. I think the future is experts who know how to use AI to turn themselves into somebody who's 10 times more productive. Yeah. Right? So you use the AI to magnify what you can do. Those will be the, the people who can do that will be the ones in the highest demand. The challenge though is we're, we're creating these gaps where um, your your junior person out of college say, like, I just hired some tech writers uh, to be on our tech writing team. And you know, they're out of college, right? So they're college grads. And they're, they're junior. They'll take, you know, a long time to become senior, but they're good. 
I can have machine learning do high school level work that's close. But I mean, it's, it's high school or freshman and college level work. That's where AI is today. Mm -hmm. But in five years, it'll be college graduate level. Well, that this means the people I just hired, I could do it with AI. Yeah. So that's going to put a lot of junior people out of work. It's going to make Just it keep harder. telling them that, yeah. though, to motivate them. Yes. They got to be motivated to work hard. Remind them every yeah. day. <laughs> yeah. But now if they could take and get the AI tools and learn to leverage it to make yeah. them the equivalent of a 10 person hire. Um, then, wow. Okay. Now I want to hire this guy because they can make AI do the work for them. Cause it's, I think that's going to be where the younger folks come in and get the advantage. If they just like in my generation, if you knew how to program, um, you get, you're super ahead of the game. You know, if you knew, if you understood technology, you were ahead of the game. Um, and so it's been a great career for me because I love technology and programming. I started programming and taught myself at 14 years old because I just loved it so much. Well, I see today these 14 year olds teaching themselves AI to get it to do whatever they want. Well, they're going to have, that's going to be a great win for them. So I think that's their path forward. Yeah. But it's creating a gap. We're getting a gap between the people who know how and the people who don't know how. And the, the experts, I just see a bigger and bigger gap. Yeah. It's going to be a challenge. Well, that, there's a, I, I guess that's where we, and where we can wrap it is, is talk about it. it says, I, I still think that there is, I, I going back again, where I started, I, I um, occasionally talk with um, soon to be grads or recent grads, you know, that, that are new to the workforce uh, to talk about focus. I used to, when I was living in the Bay area, uh, I would go and, and, uh, and actually I've presented to both uh, to groups of uh, computer science students at both Stanford and UC Berkeley. I would talk with user groups and uh, uh, about like different paths uh, within tech. And just because you're not an engineer, like I'm, I'm marketing background, but I've been in tech for 33 years. Yeah. Like I was passionate about tech. Like you, it was for me, it was junior high, 12, 13 years old, where I started to learn coding and in, in basic. Um, and, and then, you know, that's when, you know, Atari was out and then the first Mac and kind of all uh -huh. those, all those things. So playing with technology had always been part of my life. Um, and to, uh, uh, to, to find a role within that and be one of those people where I may not be able to, I'm not an engineer. I'm not, I can't code, um, you know, basic things, but I just, it's not been my job to do that, but I understand enough of it. I understand the bigger picture things to be able to go and translate mm -hmm. those things. So there, there are roles, there are opportunities for people at different places, but having this skill, being able to go and, uh, and I see this with a lot of open positions where like the, the ability to go and work with, you know, CXOs, with senior leaders and be able to communicate with them to share information like that is an important skill set that I feel like we're not focusing enough on. I agree. Yeah. And senior leadership needs that desperately. So they don't make the mistakes of trusting the CTO who wants to make his developers happy and get them the latest, greatest tools. And they code for coding's sake and not understand the real business value. And it's hard because you want to motivate your developers. You want them to be happy yeah. and they're going to be happy on the latest, greatest tools. That, and they're going to be happy if they can rewrite something instead of tweak someone else's code. But, you know, there's, you have to be really careful because uh, the, the tail can wag the dog here. The developer's the tail. And the developer has a lot of power these days. So I like be, asking be that question, though, is like, you know, can we build this? Yes. Should we build this? Yes. And having be. that discussion. And yeah. there's nothing wrong with pushing back on the technologist and say, it's like, why should we do be doing this and 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 having that? discussion that's what just yeah. needs to happen more dialogue needs to happen around yeah. these decisions yeah and stop reading those in-flight magazines ceos <laughs> come on give us a break <laughs> there's plenty of that i've experienced yeah. a lot of that yeah you go to a conference too conferences oh yes you know, Th thank so. you with all of the completely viable scenarios that we saw the smoke and wires of the, a lot of those demos. I mean, sometimes they, they're pretty oh, yeah. good and, but you know, when they're, 
you know that there were smoke and wires involved where they get you hyped up and excited about something. And they say, well, in the preview will open sometime in the next three to six months. All right. So everything we just saw <laughs> was not real. Right. Yeah. You know, I do a lot of conferences and I make sure you actually see the wires, you see the equipment. It's really working. It's real. Cause we yeah. being a tech company, we do real stuff. We don't do smoke yeah. and mirrors yeah. and it's at our competitors though. You can see a lot of smoke and mirrors going around. There's a lot of that in the industry. So yeah, get, getting the right people who can see through the smoke and see reality is gold. For I, you I just a did a demo today. And one of my favorite things to say is like, everything I'm showing you is out of the box in the product. So there's nothing, no addition, like this is the product. And yeah. it's a, it's a nice secure place to be when you're um, giving a technical demo to business owners to like, like the, the, there's, there's nothing that's, I'm not trying to pull anything over on you. But, right. Yeah. right. Well, Mike, really appreciate your time. Great, great talking to you. It's uh, again, great to uh, have somebody here local for once. It's yeah. so rare. I get to do that, but uh, really appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Enjoyed it very much. You've been listening to the Collab Talk podcast. New episodes are published weekly, and you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and most other podcast platforms. Thanks for listening.